Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Happy to have everyone here this morning. Glad to see you. Uh, if you're happy to hear, be here this morning, how about a great big amen? Amen. 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 All right. Hey, let's stand up just for a minute and greet our neighbors. All right. Some mail you'll get this week. Look at that. 
Uh, and there'll be a couple other speakers in the next couple of weeks. Thanks. All right, something else I forgot to bring up, I shot probably I'll bring up, is Charge Conference this afternoon, 3 o'clock at Bridgeton. Do we have any birthdays this week? Anniversaries? Mary Jane has a birthday. I'm Jane Jones. And I'm Jane Jones. All right. I'm Jane has a birthday. Mary Jane. She's going to admit it now. Okay. I'll see you soon.
quiet time at home, open my Bible, and just happened to open up to uh, Matthew 28. And I began reading there about the story of the resurrection and how the women came to the tomb on that Sunday morning. And it said there was a sound of a great earthquake as an angel came and let them know that Jesus was no longer there. He was alive. And then he met them on the road. Jesus met them on the road and it says they fell at his feet and worshipped him. The King of kings, Lord of lords, they worshipped him. And this next song, Majesty, is just an expression of that falling at the feet of Jesus and worshipping his glory.
except for the kids, I'd really like to have you come on up here, if you would, please. You're all set with your book and everything, aren't you? Hop. Here they come. Here comes some more. All right. is we don't want to love people 
people just pretending like we're wearing a mask, okay? We really want to love them and show them that we love them, just the same way we want people to show us that they love us, okay? Can you guys remember that? All right. Well, let's pray. God, thank you that your love for us is real and that you show it in so many ways, and especially by giving us your son Jesus to live for us, to die for us, and to be raised again to life, and he's with us here now even though we can't see him. And thank you for all of this, and teach us to love others the way you love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hey, Tony, you, uh, you gave me antlers last Christmas, and I just want you to have <laughs> Show it, right? Would you please? It may take me a while, but we will get paid back. <laughs> All right. Well, as we come before God in prayer, as we prepare to come before God in prayer, are there joys or concerns that you'd like to share this morning? And I know I want to just prime the pump. I uh, was talking with Ross just before the service, and I know it's hard, you know, to end a football season where everybody's worked so hard and so long. And they put, you know, they put a lot into it and they end on a note like that. It's hard. But I just want to say to him and also, you know, we've had, um, oh, Bailey Hayes, who attends here sometimes, uh, she ran, she represented the school and the community in semi-state at Cross Country. And uh, even though her mom said yeah, it was okay, but she didn't advance the state, you know, she really represented the school and the community well. And uh, I'm just, I'm just proud of all of those, uh, our students who represent us, the community, the school, so well. And I want to thank you for that, and congratulations on a good year. <laughs> Are there other joys that you'd like to share this morning? Yes. The microphone's coming. What a handsome guy from <laughs> Tuesday on his back with a ruptured disc and then they turned around he still had more rupturing in that area and they had to do another surgery on Thursday but he's home and he's doing better and he's still going to have a long road with therapy and so we don't know when he's going to go back to work but then his wife Mandy she's got a shoulder problem and her mother just found out she has cancer so they're kind of hit from all sides so thank you for all your prayers. Guy's gonna be embarrassed, but we have a big phrase. He finally got his hearing aids. So if you're talking to Guy, he can now hear you. <laughs> and pray, pray for me too. That's a real blessing. I was telling your wife, you know, that when my brother had his eye surgery, he had really bad eyes, and when he had that eye surgery and could finally see again, how he would sit at the window when it started raining because he wanted to see the individual raindrops. You know, it's like I'm sure you can hear the sound of rustling paper and all of that kind of stuff. Now, what a what a joy! All right, other joys or concerns? Well, tell you what, I know that there are a number of concerns printed in your bulletin. I encourage you to take a look at that and uh, just remember those people in your prayers. Um, and remember uh, the churches that are coming together today for charge conferences. It's a very important time, and so I want to lift those up in our prayers too. And as we uh, prepare to come before God in prayer, I'd like to invite us to join together in our prayer chorus, which is uh, an old familiar hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
the song pretty much says it. What a friend we have in Jesus. And what blessing, what comfort, what hope we miss when we forget, Lord, that you are right here waiting to meet us. If we will but turn our hearts and minds to you. I can't speak for everybody else, but I know for me this week there have been several times when I've been rushing around and dealing with this detail and that crisis and this agenda item, that meeting, and, and it's so easy to just think that we're doing this all on our own. Thank you for this reminder, this moment to come before you and wait before you. Lord, we're so thankful that you are the kind of friend that cares about each of the, the joys that we've shared this morning, the successes in sports, the successful surgeries, hearing aids, the ability to hear, Lord, we thank you for all of our senses and for the joy that that brings. And Lord, we thank you that you are also a friend who cares about each of our concerns. There are so many, many who are listed in our bulletin, and some are dealing with health concerns, and we lift them up and pray for their healing for the awareness of your presence as they wait on that healing. And we pray for those who are going through uncertainty in regard to job situation or family situation or just other news that they're waiting on. And we pray that your peace that passes understanding would meet each person at the point of his or her need as well as address those circumstances. Oh, and Lord, I want to thank you for the job that London Church got this week working at the Dairy Queen. And we pray for guidance for her as she begins in that new job even today. Lord, we thank you for all of the churches in our cluster that uh, will be meeting together this afternoon to try to conference. And we pray that as we come together to celebrate our common ministry, our common connectedness in you, we pray that you would guide in each and every aspect of that meeting, that all would go well, and that we would lead that as stronger churches, ready to go out and to fulfill your call to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Lord, all of these prayers, we lift up to you in the name of Christ. As we bring all our prayers together in one that keeps us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into 
No, I'm not Sue, and thank you, Sue, because I get some words that are hard to pronounce, so. <laughs> <laughs> the Old Testament reading is Judges 6, 7 through 16. This is read from the New International Version. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, sent us. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you, rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hands of all your oppressors. I drove them away before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. And then the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abzurite, <laughs> um, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, Lord, Gideon said, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of the Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest of the Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord said, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, Midianites, leaving none alive. Hmm, what a gruesome story. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. John 8, 2-11 At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? But they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his fingers. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. and steals its bone and has no idea what just happened. 
it's funny when it's an animal. It's not so funny when people do the same thing. Especially when the people of God do the same thing. You know, Albert Einstein is credited with saying that the definition of insanity, or a good definition of insanity, is doing the same thing you've always done in the same way you've always done it, and then expecting different results. And yet, is that not exactly what we see in the book of Judges? God's people committing the same sins over and over, reaping the same consequences over and over, and then trying to figure out, why is this happening to us again? So what can we learn from the Israelites? And how can maybe we change that pattern? Talk about that in a minute, but first let's pray. Lord, we don't want to be just Christians who chase our tail while the lost world looks on and laughs or steals our bone. We want to be your disciples, leading the way to new life. So help us to learn from the example of the Israelites, we pray, and lead us, lead us, that we may in turn lead others. Amen. Well, this is week number eight in our series, uh, Working Our Way, Our Journey Through the Bible, that we're for which we're using the condensed version of the Bible called the story. And we're now at the point where it's getting too long to go back and, you know, rehash everything. So let me just remind you, if you were here last week or if you weren't, last week we talked about how the Israelites, after leaving Egypt, finally came into the land that God had promised to them. And they were told to, you know, this was, we talked about this, this is hard. They're told to go in and wipe out all the nations that are, that are living there. And, and it says over and over that they did that. But we find out later in the book of Judges that it wasn't a total annihilation after all. Now they went into certain cities and slaughtered everybody in that city and broke the city down and burned it and all of this. But there were other people living around different places. And they didn't rout all of them. And so now in the book of Judges that we're dealing with today, we find that um, this, there's a pattern that begins happening, and it's summarized in the book of Judges, chapter 2, verses 11 through 23. You want to show that, Mark? And this is a, a, an abbreviated version. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. In his anger, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them, and they were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges, and judges in this term means a, a leader who is uh, appointed, called to lead the people out of their difficult situations and to uh, kind of manage things for the time being. The Lord raised up judges who saved them. Yet they would not listen to their judges. When the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. And the dog keeps chasing its tail. Next slide. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord as their ancestors did. And so the cycle continues, the pattern continues. And all throughout the book of Judges, we have one story after another that begins with, then the people did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and so the Lord gave them over to various other people to oppress them. Next slide. 
And some of the major oppressors, this is not um, all of them, and it's not all of the judges, but this is kind of the, the major uh, themes here. We have uh, first the Mesopotamians, and they're uh, routed by Othniel's uh, people. And then we have the Moabites oppressing the Israelites, and Ehud is the one who is raised up as the judge to lead them. And then the Canaanites, uh, who are routed by Deborah and Barak, or Barak, uh, if you want to pronounce it that way. Then the Midianites, whom, um, who come and oppress the people for many years, and Gideon is raised up as the leader. The Amorites, Jeff, I kind of want to throw in here, you know, the termites and Orkin came in. <laughs> And then there's the Philistines, and uh, Samson delivers them. That's a famous story. But, but the one that, I have to tell you, really captures my imagination as, uh, as I read the book of Judges, uh, it would have to be Gideon. And his story is told in Judges chapter 6 through 8. Um, you know, you heard the, the beginning of that story, as Mary read it this morning. In the beginning, you know, the Midianites were so oppressive, they were wreaking so much havoc on the Israelites that, that in order to um, survive, the Israelites had taken to living in caves and hiding in different areas. And Gideon himself was threshing out wheat in a, in a wine press, trying to keep it from being seen so that the Midianites wouldn't come and, and steal his lunch, steal his boat. <laughs> so he's there hiding for fear of Midianites when this angel of the Lord appears to him and greets him. <laughs> the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> and you can just kind of picture Gideon going, are you talking to me? <laughs> yes, I'm talking to you. And Gideon responds, okay, if the Lord is with us, why is all this stuff happening to us? You know, he hasn't learned. He hasn't read the book of Judges because they're living it. Why is all this stuff happening to us? And don't we ask the same question when things are not going well? Why is all this happening to us? And then he says, listen, you are the one that God has chosen, and, and the Lord will be with you. And well, how, does, how does Gideon respond? Excuse me? Doesn't God understand? I'm a nobody. Not only is my family the, the least in the, my clan, my clan is the least in the whole tribe of Manasseh. I think, you're talking to the wrong guy. Then finally, he decides to test the Lord. Okay, if the Lord is with me, here, let's do this. And in fact, the angel tells him, get, get some stuff. And, and the Lord burns up this offering that Gideon brings. And then, and then Gideon wants to test him again. He says, he takes a lamb's fleece and he puts it on the ground. He says, okay, if the Lord is with me, in the morning, let there be dew on the fleece, but not on the ground around. And so it happens. And then the next night, Gideon says, let's reverse that for tomorrow. And so he does the whole thing over again, and indeed there's dew on the ground, but not on the fleece. So Gideon decides, okay, 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 um, maybe the Lord is with me, so, all right, what do we need to do? Uh, give me a whole bunch of people. I've got like 32,000 people. And God says, um, no, that's too many. Are you serious? And God says, all right, Gideon, tell everybody of those 32,000 who's afraid that they can go home. And so Gideon does, and 22,000 of them go. Well, Gideon's still looking at, uh, you know, about 12,000. He says, all right, all right, all right, this is not great, but this is doable. And God says, that's still too many. Huh? What? God says, here, here's what we're going to do. Take all the men that are left. Take them down to the, the, the brook. Have them drink. And God says, watch. Because the people who scoop up the water with their hands, I don't want them. I want the ones who lap the water like a dog. There's only 300 men that lap up the water like dogs. 
God says, with those, I'm going to deliver you. <laughs> it's like, but have you seen how many people they have? God says, yeah, I've seen them. All right, all right. Okay, 300, let me have them get their swords. And God says, no, 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 no swords. We're not sword fighting. What? Yeah, I want you to get a bunch of clay jars. And I want you to put torches in them. And I want you to go down to the Midianite camp at night. And what you're going to do is you're going to have these lighted torches inside these jars. And, and when you get around camp, you're going to smash these jars, take out the torches, and say, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. But Lord, we don't have swords. All we have is jars and torches. God says, no, that's okay, that's enough. If you were Gideon, how would you be feeling about that? Okay, I'm going to go up against thousands of Midianites with a bunch of clay jars and torches. Me. Lord, you're going to give us squirt guns? Yeah. But with those people and with those weapons, God routes the Midianites. And it's a massive victory. Gideon is, is victorious. That's an interesting enough story on its own, but of course, there's always a question, so what? What does that have to do with us today? What can we learn from this that we could apply to our lives today? I'd like to suggest that there are at least uh, three lessons that we can learn. The first one I would suggest to you is that, like the Midianites, we have a mission, and God expects us to do it. Now, in the Old Testament, with the Israelites, basically that mission is summarized in two different places. The first one is in Genesis chapter 12, when God is talking with Abraham, or Abram at that point. And he says to Abram, I am calling you, I want you to go to this land that I have yet to show you, and there I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you may be a blessing. So that you may be a blessing to all those around you. In fact, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. That's God's call. It's not to go to this land just to be comfy cozy. It's to go to this land to live in God's way such that all of the people around can see these people are different. That's what Peter was saying in the, in the letter of 1 Peter that Mary read. He says, I want you to be like aliens and strangers in the land so that even if they criticize you, they can't help but look at you and see what good lives you live and give praise to God. Which brings me to, you know, it's not just the Israelites who have a call, the church has a call. And Jesus himself issued it. He says, I want you to go and make disciples. This was just before he ascended to heaven. He says, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And these are not oppressive laws. These are laws where Jesus says, love. And love not just those who love you, but love the least of these, and even those who oppress you. Okay? That's what we are to do. That is our call. Now, the problem comes when we begin to think that our call as Christians is just to be nice. And to not get into trouble. Keep our noses clean and just not get into trouble. And I want to suggest to you that this is what God is angry about with the Israelites. It says a couple of times in the passages that we read, God was angry, in fact, it says very angry 
with the Israelites. Why? Just because they were messed up? No, because they were failing to fulfill their calling to be a light to the nations. They were failing to live out the will and the way of God in such a way that others could look and say, this is, this is good, this is different, we, this is attractive. No, instead they adapted to the ways of the world. And that's what God was angry about. Not just, he didn't just want them to keep their noses clean. And when I think about that, I can't help thinking about a story that a friend of mine told me. Um, he's a pastor in Indiana, United Methodist pastor. His name is Rick Taylor. And uh, Rick tells a story about when he was in uh, junior high. And uh, there was a, a class that he was in, his shop class. And, but um, they had one day where the teacher gave them an assignment, you know, uh, something that they were to be doing at their desks. And he said, I have to leave for a few minutes, but I'll be back in, in just a, a bit. He says, I want you to work on this assignment. He put the assignment on the board. Well, the teacher left. Okay, it's junior high, right? So what happens when the teacher leaves? Ooh, the spitballs start flying. You know, people start talking to each other, punching one another, moving around the room and everything like that. Ah, the teacher forgot something. <laughs> he came back before they expected. And my friend Rick says how, you know, he was watching these other guys because Rick was a good kid. And he was watching these other kids throwing spitballs and fighting with each other and moving around the room and everything. And the teacher shows up at the door. He sees what's going on. And he points to Taylor and he says, Taylor, what are you doing? And Rick says, I wasn't doing anything. And he said, that's exactly my point. I gave you an assignment. I expect you to be doing it. God has given us an assignment to make disciples of all people. Are we doing it? Second thing I believe we can learn from the story of Gideon. God often chooses as leaders those who are least likely to succeed. You know, in school, we have, we have uh, I, I don't know, back when I was in school, you know, they voted for most likely to succeed. God seems to have this way of choosing people that if they were, people were writing in their yearbook, they would say, chosen as least likely to succeed. And the Bible is full of those kinds of stories. And we've heard several of them in the last few weeks. We have Abram and Sarah, an old couple childless, and yet God says, I'm going to choose you to, to begin a great nation. We have um, Moses. Moses, who was the son of slaves, and he's floated down the river and adopted by the Pharaoh's family, but later he kills an Egyptian, and so he becomes a runaway felon, a fugitive felon. And God comes to him and says, got an assignment for you. And of course Moses is going, oh, not me? Oh, you got the wrong guy. Kind of like Gideon. And then next week, Pastor Deb is going to be talking about Ruth. A foreigner, for heaven's sake. One of those people from, the, one of the Moabite. You know, one of the people that has been oppressing the Jews. And God chooses her well, I'm not going to steal your thunder. Come next week, find out. <laughs> God often chooses as, as leaders the least likely to succeed. And then I want you to remember what I've, I've seen sometimes in posters. And it says, you know, we need to remember that God often doesn't call the best equipped. God equips those whom God calls. And sometimes the equipment that God gives us may not seem like enough, like with Gideon. Uh, come on, Lord, jars, torches against thousands of, of Midianites? Are you serious? But what was the main thing that God told Gideon? I'll be with you. See, and we can either believe that
that or not. That's where faith comes in. Are we going to believe that God is with us? Or are we just going to make sure that we got all of our ducks and chickens or whatever they are in a row so that we know, yeah, boy, this is just all the equations come out. We can do this. We can do this. No, sometimes God says, I want you to do it. I will be with you. And when you get into it, I'll show you how I'm going to provide. Third thing I believe we can learn is that God not only, God's calling requires not only faith, but ongoing faithfulness. There's an interesting part of Gideon's story that we often don't hear, and it comes at the end. After Gideon and the 300 have routed the Midianites, and it's a, it's a marvelous victory, and they come back together, and oh boy, as you can imagine, the people start saying, wow, Gideon, this is awesome. We want you to be our ruler. And I love Gideon's response. He says, huh? -uh. Guys, this wasn't my victory. This was the Lord's victory. Let the Lord rule you. But then, I don't know if this is to kind of appease the people or if he really thinks he's doing the right thing. But Gideon says, yeah, tell you what, here's what we'll do. We took a lot of plunder, you know, when we were out the Midianites. I, I want everybody to bring, you know, some gold here. And, and what he did was after they brought their gold, he didn't keep it for himself. He fashioned it into what's called an ephod. If you've never heard that word before, uh, let me show you the next slide. An ephod, this is a, a picture of a typical priest in, uh, back in that day, Jewish priest. And an ephod was basically this vest, uh, loincloth combination that was worn by the priests. It was a holy garment. It was to be used by the priests in their official duties. Well, Gideon had this gold fashioned into an ephod of gold. Why? I'm not sure. I'd like to believe that it's because he wanted to say, you know, the, the ephod is a priestly garment. It reminds us of God's presence and power, and, and I want this to be a reminder. But God didn't tell him to do that. And what happened was the ephod, the golden ephod, became a snare to the people. People began coming and worshiping, bowing down before the ephod for crying out loud. And it says that even Gideon and his own family fell into that trap. It became an idol for them. And I want to suggest to you that we too can take symbols in a well-meaning way and turn them into idols. If we take anything in this sanctuary and say, God forbid that God ever takes it away from us. If we were to say, these stained glass windows, it, We'll do anything, but God, don't, don't take these stained glass windows away from us. And the stained glass windows become an idol, rather than pointing us to the God of heaven. So God's calling requires not only faith, but ongoing faithfulness. And how do we stay faithful? Uh, I know what you would expect me to say, stay in your Bible, stay consistent with prayer. You know, we hear that over and over and over. But I want to stress again one more thing, and I've said this often. But folks, we need to develop a support network around ourselves of other people who will hold us accountable, who will not only encourage us, 
but say to us, you know, Gideon, I wish Gideon had some people who said, uh, Gideon, this golden ephod idea, I know you mean well. Oh, but think about what could happen. That's supposed to be a priestly garment worn only by the priest for specific reasons when they're acting on behalf of God. Oh, Gideon, rethink that golden ephod thing, will you? Sometimes we need to gather people around us who will hold us accountable, challenge some of the ways that we're living and thinking. And we need to be willing to do that for other people, knowing that there are people right here in this sanctuary today who are looking at you, who are looking at me, and there are other people out there who are looking at us and wanting us to be one of those few good men or women that's living according to God's way faithfully. This is a very personal story. Uh, I may have told you before that my father, when he was just a baby, his father abandoned him. My dad didn't see his dad but maybe two times after that in his whole life. He was raised by a single mom who never remarried and by his older sister. Um, Sadly, she became alcoholic, and it was a very difficult thing. And, I, and yet my dad was an amazing man. And I remember one time when he was about 70 years old or so, I sat down with him, and we were just having kind of a heart-to-heart. -heart. And I decided to ask him something that had been rumbling around my head for a long time. I said, Dad, I have always been wanting to ask you this question. How is it that when you were raised without a dad, you became such a good dad? And he said, well, let me tell you something, son. When your mother and I married, by the way, my mother was a preacher's kid. <laughs> he said, when your mother and I married, there was not a question as to whether we were going to church or not. That was a done deal. That was part of the package. So I decided that if I was going to have to go to church, I was going to make myself a student. And I started looking around at the men in that congregation and studying how they were as men and how they were as dads. And I began taking notes and just trying some of the things that I was seeing and hearing from them. You think that people aren't looking to you and to me to set the example? You better think again. Because I dare say there may be one of you out here right now that's in exactly the same situation as my dad was. And you're looking around. And you're taking notes. Folks, Take that seriously. Remain faithful to your call. And above all, remember two things. When you fail, because inevitably all of us will at some point or another, remember that we have a God who stands ready to forgive. I love the story that Mary read from the Gospel of Matthew. The woman caught in adultery. People brought her to Jesus and said, the law says that we should stone such a woman. What do you say? And Jesus says, I'll tell you what, whoever is without sin, let him cast the first stone. They have at it. Here. Here's rocks. Eight by one. And one by one, they left. And he says to the woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they've left. He says, so nobody condemns you. Neither do I condemn you. Now go. And sin no more. And I can't help but wonder how her life was changed from that point. Who began watching her? And for whom she became a mentor, a guide. I wish we had the rest.
rest of that story, but I'll probably wait, have to wait until I get to heaven to learn what it was. So I just want to ask you in conclusion, where and how might God be calling you to lead? By example, in your church, in your family, in your school, in your community? And what is your excuse for not leading as God is calling you to lead? Oh, God, don't you know, I, don't you know my family background? I, yeah, I'm like Gideon. I mean, I'm the least in my family. My family is like, why my family so messed up? You, yeah, you can't expect this of me. God, I don't have the resources on my own. Remember, the one promise that God gives us, I will be with you. And with God. Excuse me, but what's impossible? Nothing. Amen. I'd like to invite the ushers at this time to come forward that we might share with God our offerings of thanksgiving.
So go from this place, knowing that God goes with you. Go and share that message, not only in what you say, but in what you do.